It's really great to have Deborah Meaden with us this afternoon at our conference. Deborah, as well as uh, her stardom in Dragon's Den, has been a stalwart of the pro-European movement for as long as I've been uh, in the vanguard too for the last uh, four years. She's done lots of events. She's absolutely up there uh, on Twitter, and she couldn't be clearer in her view that uh, Britain's future lies as part of Europe. So Deborah, it's really, really good to have you, have you with us. And I know you're doing all the promotion for a new series, which I'm told is moving to BBC One. So oh, you're, yes. it's onwards and upwards. Um, yes. if, if, if Boris did the thing that he should do, which is to make you his business czar, and your many admirers on Dragon's Den are watching today would love that to happen, what would you tell him to do in terms of a strategy for Britain's business community in the position we are now with Brexit and, of course, hoping to come out of COVID-19? Well, the first thing I would say is that, that if I was going to have been involved, I would have liked to have been involved earlier um, because, of course, what we're dealing with is a lot of aftermath at the moment. Um, you know, and I always say in business, get me, ask me when I can actually make a difference. But, you know, we're here. Um, I think the most frustrating I see at the most frustrating thing I see at the moment is that they're kind of trying to deal with business as business, well, if, in as much as they're trying to deal with business. Um, and of course, business is made up of a lot of different industries with a lot of different issues. Uh, it needs to be broken down and they need to be dealing with, with real people who are experiencing real issues in those industries. But more important than that, they need to have a proper will to make things work, and not just talk sound bites. You know, I think it's coming home to roost that we're saying a lot of words, but actually the action isn't following through. So, it, you know, a real commitment to making real change, speaking to all of the individual industries to say, what are your, what's your priority of issues? There's lots of issues, but what have we got to do to get this structurally right for you? And then commit to doing it, because I just see too many words and not enough action. And, and on Brexit, which is clearly one of the biggest challenges facing business, including the hundreds of thousands of SMEs that trade with Europe, he's obviously not going to reverse Brexit, as many of us would like him to do. But given the situation that we're now in, and we are where we are, what would you tell him to do as the sensible next steps to see that uh, we forge a better rather than a worse way out of uh, this Brexit crisis? Well, there's, I think there's, two, there's the technical issues so that we weren't ready. It's, it's really simple and it's very, very obvious. You know, um, businesses didn't know what to do. They were told to get ready. Absolutely no idea what that was. So we need a clear path on, you know, these are the systems and processes that you can follow. And, you know, that's how we can smooth the path. You know, it'll never be as smooth as open doors, but that's how we can smooth the path. The problem with that is we are way behind the pace. So we need to concentrate. I know there's a pandemic going on. I know there's a lot going on, but government has to deal with a multitude of issues. And right now they need to get their systems and processes sorted. I know for a fact that our software and our systems and our processes are way behind the face. So they've absolutely got to get that sorted. And then they need to deliver a constructive message, not just get yourself ready. You know, what does get yourself ready mean? I talk to people with big businesses who export all over the world that have been caught out, who have had entire departments working out how to deal with Brexit. And then the day it happened, we're like, oh my goodness, I never thought of that. Nobody had. Do you think the CBI and the business community have been uh, forthright enough? They clearly took a decision when it was uh, clear that Brexit was going to happen, that they wanted to try and get alongside the government to do a kind of softly, softly approach rather than a, a megaphone approach. But... From where I sit, it looks as if the business community is almost silent in the face of all these problems. What would be your advice to the leaders of the CBI, the Small Business Federation, bodies like that, who obviously would have preferred that we stayed in the EU, but now that we're leaving, have decided to essentially go silent and hope that they can persuade the government to sort things out rather than taking a public line? What would, what would your advice to them be? So, I, I mean, I'm in a fortunate position. I don't have shareholders. I've got me, you know, and I all, I do understand that I'm not representing a group of people. So I can, un you know, I can speak untempered. So I, I do actually understand an issue, but there is a big fear about using the Brexit word. You know, it's just like, oh, we're going to talk about Brexit because it's all it's going to stir up all sorts of trouble. But actually, we need to start talking about it in a constructive way. You know, there is no point. We, sh we should look back at what is, has gone wrong only to 
fix it. You know, it's no point going, I wish we were, but we're out of, you know, we're out of the EU. Brexit has happened. We now look need to be really clear on the bits that are not working, which frankly is a lot of it, and, and be constructive about how to fix it. That's how the language should be. And we shouldn't be fearful of that. Business should be saying, this is how you can fix it. You know, this is what you can do to help us thrive, you know, survive into the future. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's a little bit of residual fear because they were worried prior to Brexit that it was a little bit toxic. You know, and but if they don't get it sorted, it's going to be a lot more toxic. Yeah, yeah. And give us some advice as a European movement. Treat us as one of your cases in the Dragon's Den. We're an SME that's now trying to become much, much bigger and expand our markets to make a big impact. And we need to if we're going to get Britain where it needs to be in uh, the mainstream of Europe again. What advice would you give to me, the incoming chair of the European movement and all of my colleagues and the 11,000 members that we've got, all of whom desperately, desperately want a pathway back into the heart of Europe? And we're about as far away from that as it's possible to be at the moment. How do we how do we break through? So I think that we're still we're still really divided. I mean, what I don't understand is why we're still carrying Brexit forward. Brexit to me is gone. That's it. You know, we're, we're here where we are and we need to have a constructive language. And we're not. You know, we, we kind of I was hoping that when we, we kept, you know, the upside of coming out of the EU would be we would start taking responsibility. We have nobody to blame. And of course, that's not happening because we're still trying to blame the EU. So I think it's really important that we 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 are not divisive in our language. That this is you know that we are we're embracing and language in this case. I always say you know words are just words, but actually our language in this instance is really really important. And what we shouldn't be trying to do is set ourselves up against people who didn't want to you know who did want to leave the EU versus people who didn't want to leave the EU because we've left the EU. So let's find a let's find a common language. But I do, and if you follow me on Twitter, I every now and then can't help myself. I've noticed. I I, I <laughs> so these are wise words, but I don't always follow them myself. <laughs> I have to say something. <laughs> now the, la the last question I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you notice of it, so because I'll go somewhere else before, is what slogan you'd suggest for us? Because you know, all successful businesses have a catchphrase or a catch line. You know, what is it? Is it in one sense that they're trying to do? But I'll give you notice of that. And we'll come to that at the end. But uh, in the House of Lords, we've got uh, Lord Frost, the guy who's responsible for this trade and cooperation agreement. And I face him in there every day at the moment. And he keeps going on to me about how his job title includes Minister for the Opportunities of Brexit, he says. Now, whenever, whenever he says that phrase, the opportunities of Brexit, hilarious laughter breaks out across the House of Lords. But trying to take him at his word, what are the opportunities of Brexit and what should we be saying in terms of making the most of it, which, of course, we all want to do on behalf of the country? Well, of course, there will be opportunities, you know, OK, I didn't want to leave the, leave the EU, but actually some industries will change. They will thrive. Um, but it's really hard to see them when there's so much muddle going on. And that's the bit I blame the government for allowing the muddle. You know, because actually we should all have a, a clear platform to be able to start looking forward and thinking, OK, well, you know, at least we have a path. So I so so I think. It's very difficult to tell at the moment. I do think that there are some real, there could be some real environmental benefits. You know, I think we could, one of the things I talk about to businesses is that the businesses that win now are those that are fleet of foot. And as a country, we should be able to be more fleet of foot, not too fleet of foot, because you could actually just end up doing lots of knee jerk reactions. But, you know, knowing way a clear path that says this is what we are going to be. You know, and therefore our decisions are going to be made in those frameworks and we can make our decisions quicker that we should be able to take advantages quicker than a big block that's got to get everybody on board. But that does rely on a clarity of thinking and a clarity of system and a clarity of process that I see missing. The bit the bit where of. Um post-Brexit where we have been fleet of foot. Indeed, Ursula von der Leyen famously said that uh, the problem with the EU is it's a tanker and it can't operate like a one-nation speedboat. It was quite clear she was talking about Britain in respect of the vaccine procurement and rollout. If you looked at that is clearly the thing we've got, uh, we've done right as a country since uh, 
Brexit. And you can have a debate. I think we would have been able to do it even if we'd been in the EU because we had a right to opt out of their procurement and so on. But let's just take, you know, the situation as it is at the moment. It's a success and it's because we were fleet of foot. What can we learn from that specific vaccine experience, in particular the, the speed with which we deployed the business opportunity of it, with Kate Bingham going out there and doing a really good job of, um, of signing up um, COVID-19 vaccine supplies. What lesson could we learn from that in our post-Brexit business community, do you think? Well, that is exactly the lesson we can learn, isn't it? We, we should be able to spot opportunity. It's, it's no, I'm, I'm going to talk about SMEs versus big giant corps. You know, SMEs have a huge advantage that they could, they, their nose is very close to the ground, so they could, should be able to, you know, sense the mood and very quickly respond to that. Where a giant corp, you know, they've got to change all their systems and their processes and their, you know, and the decision makers are often quite removed from the people on the ground. So, you know, we should be able to, you know, be paying attention, have a really good sense to our mood and the mood of the world going on out there and absolutely go for it. I mean, that is a clear, that's what we should be doing, but we're not, we are muddled. And and it's actually, it's fantastic the way we've rolled out the vaccine, but there are, there are a multitude of other issues and it's not good enough as a government to get one thing really right and completely ignore something that's going to affect the future of our nation of our next generation for, for years to come you know so so yeah brilliant on the vaccine now what about the rest now you, you see uh, new and growing businesses every day deborah have you seen any which have genuinely uh, got there because of the opportunities of Brexit. Are there businesses that you encounter out there, which being honest, because it's very important that we pro-Europeans look at both sides of the coin and learn from the opportunities of, uh, of different uh, courses of action. Are there people out there who are actually spotting market and business opportunities caused by Brexit and going for it? Or is, is, it, is it a complete void? No, so I think it's very early to say that because um, a lot of the issues that, that I'm seeing are calls through manufacturing, you know, one widget of a tyre piece they can't bring in anymore. It has to be sourced in Italy or, you know, and of course, what will eventually come out of that is that we will we will start getting probably specialist industries of our own. I mean, we're never going to be China. We're never going to be Eastern Europe. We're not going to we're not going to turn into this and we shouldn't probably turn into this massive manufacturing um the country that has a massive manufacturing. Um, but I think there will be gaps filled in, you know, and, and I've spotted it in a lot of the businesses. I've, I've invested in 19 businesses at the moment. And, and in all of those, even with all of the work that we did to get ready, you know, there are holes and, and people are beginning to say, oh, actually, I can supply that. But it's going to take me three months to sort out, whereas I would have been able to say, well, we want it tomorrow, please. And, and it would in it will come. So I actually think it's really early and I am keeping my powder dry. I, If you ask me now, should we go back into the EU? I would say I don't know because we've been through a lot of turmoil. And and I think, to be fair, I need to see it settle down a little bit. I want to know what is happening because our government isn't on top of it or what, it, what actually what the opportunities could be. Now, I have a feeling sitting on my shoulder that if you ask me in five years' time, I'm going to go say, yes, please, I'd like to be back in the EU. But I am keeping my powder dry on that. Can you tell us, you're invested in 19, in 19 businesses at the moment. Can you tell us which is the most exciting? Or would that be invidious to the other 18? <laughs> Me who my favourite child is. I can't possibly say that. Exciting. <laughs> <laughs> you tell us one which is exciting. You know, titillate so, for these views. Fantastic business that um, that that came into. It was a dragon's den business. It came into the den, and they started pitching towels. For goodness' sake, towels. I mean, towels. They're not new. We've all had towels. <laughs> But these were these were ultra absorbent, really cool looking towels. Anyway, I invested in them. I think they were turning over about half a million pounds at the time. Um, and this year, even with a pandemic, bearing in mind they're travel towels. So these, you know, they, they, they should have been completely devastated by the pandemic. But they're good people. And they switched into home, you know, hair wraps, 
scrunchies for your hair. So they switched into home products. That's what I find really exciting when, when I'm working with entrepreneurs who instead of thinking, oh my goodness, my business is going to fail, you know, actually think, right, now, now we've got a challenge. Now what are we going to do about it? That's what I find exciting. I have to say, very pleased to say, that, that all of my businesses have done that, but I suspect that probably maybe two of them won't make it. Two of the 19. Now tell us, what's the unique selling point of these towels? You say they're travel towels. Does that mean they're particularly yeah. compact or, or so, what? Absolutely. Very, they're very cool. They're, they're very iconic. It's called Dock and Bay and they're striped towels. So they're very iconic, very easy to spot super absorbent and pack up to the tiniest little square so they're fantastic for families to take on holiday or backpackers to go you know stick in the back of their rucksack um you know and as i say what of all the businesses i looked at and thought actually in the pandemic that might be a bit of an issue no not top of bay because they got on with it you know what, they were what, clear. that's what our government needs to be they they thought to themselves here's the issue and now there's, we're there's out there his hands are hovering over the uh uh, the mouse at the moment to look this up what's the name of these towels dock and bay dock and yeah. bay right okay because we might see whether we can get some uh, european you know motifs on the towels oh, of, <laughs> <laughs> they're the real striped you say they're striped at the moment they are striped. That's <laughs> good. Good. well that's good good to know so you think of the 19 17 will come through okay yes and, and that's the, that's mate that's well no it's you see it's very hard to tell What's pandemic? No, actually, that's not true. I was about to say something, and that's not true. I can tell what's pandemic and what's Brexit. You know, I can tell if it's delivery. If I can't supply, if I can't get anything anymore, um, of, of, you know, in a, in a in a country that's open from China, um, uh, because it was coming from China through Europe to the UK, you know, uh, and it suddenly stopped. That's Brexit. That's not yeah. the pandemic. You know, it's yeah. so yeah. I can yeah. tell. Yeah, and then finally, Deborah, you've got a slogan for us. I have. What, you can't. What, what, would you, what, what, what would you go with out there? Or, or? You cannot ask me a question and then talk to me for ten minutes and then ask me to come up with a slogan. No, I. Do you know what I've learned, Andrew? The art of saying no, I can't. Do you like building bridges? Because what we're all talking about today is building bridges with Europe. How does that does that excite you? Or do we need to do better than that? That's a, it, that's a little bit construction. Bit, a bit. That's a bit heavy, heavy as in feet planted on the ground. Right. It feels to me like uh, any anything we talk about needs to have a lightness about it. It has to have a joy about it. It has to have a goodness about it. You know, it's not it's not coming from broken. Uh, it is sadly coming from broken, but we shouldn't carry that message forward. You know, we we should find something that talks about the new relationship and the joy and the friendship and the partnership that we're going to have going forward. I think if you talk building bridges, you've got a constant reminder. Well, if I just if I pick out the words that we've got new joy and partnership, that's not bad. The new joyful partnership with Europe. That's where we are with <laughs> with <laughs> <laughs> All with, uh, with the next series of Dragon's Den. It's been really, really great having you in our conference today. And uh, just to say, if we can get the, the European movement, like one of your 19 businesses, but one of the ones that survives rather than one of the ones that fails, we'll be doing well. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you for having me, Andrew. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.